So we move now from the era of the fife and the drum to the era of that foot-stomping music called ragtime and the story of the king, Scott Joplin. We'll take our time with this one because as Joplin always admonished, it is never right to play ragtime fast. <laughs> Scott Joplin is remembered as the king of ragtime music, not because he invented the genre, but because he brought it to new levels of sophistication, blending elements of African and European music to create what's been called the first truly original American music. Joplin published, Joplin performed, Joplin made piano rolls, Joplin was ragtime for a lot of people, and ragtime became the most exciting new popular music of the, the era. So sure, he might have been the first really important African-American superstar in the music industry. This was the age of Jim Crow and John Philip Sousa. And this music from across the tracks with its ragged time seemed to break the rules. It crossed color lines. It was slightly dangerous and deliciously scandalous. You know what it kind of reminds me of? It's kind of like rock and roll. You know, something different. People didn't want to accept it like they thought it was making people go a little nutty. And it was also, I think, it was because of the places where it was being played and low-class places like bars and saloons you know, and the red light areas. There are two different rhythms playing simultaneously. We have an uneven rhythm in the right hand playing a syncopated melody and the left hand maintains an even steady time. So if you hear the left hand by itself, it has an even and steady rhythm like the ticking of a clock. But the right hand syncopated melody is very uneven. When you put them together, something magical happens. Scott Joplin was born around 1868 on a farm in East Texas. Largely self-taught, he showed an early talent for music, and by the time he was 11, he was playing and composing for a variety of instruments. While still in his teens, he hit the road and spent most of a decade wandering throughout the Mid-South and Midwest, playing in pool halls, saloons, theaters, and brothels. The mix of people, cultures, and musical styles he met in his travels would find their way into the melodies and rhythms of his compositions. In 1896, Joplin moved to Sedalia, Missouri, where his career took a few interesting turns. He began to formally study music at the George R. Smith College, a school for African Americans. He began to experiment with more complex musical ideas and rhythms. He got a job playing piano in a place called the Maple Leaf Club, where he composed the Maple Leaf Rag, which became a national success and provided him with some financial stability. turn of the century, Sedalia was a boom town with a busy nightlife and a large and prosperous African-American community. There was George R. Smith College, also a few black newspapers and social clubs, the Maple Leaf Club and the Black 400 Club. We in Sedalia have always been very musically inclined. See, because the railroad was going through here, railroad had attracted a lot of young laborers and so it had a very vibrant and exciting African-American community. Joplin spent his time in Sedalia honing his skills, studying music at the college, playing for the town's social elite and its seedier side, guided by the goal of bringing his music to a higher strata of sophistication and acceptance. It was in Sedalia that he met publisher John Stark, who became a lifelong associate. Today, Sedalia calls itself the Cradle of Ragtime and celebrates Joplin every year in the first week of June with a festival dedicated to his music. I am going to be playing Swipesy Cakewalk, which was written right here in Sedalia by Scott Joplin in 1900. <laughs> At 
And all these years later, in Sedalia, Scott Joplin is favorite son. Yes. Took a long time. It took a great deal of time. Actually, interest in Joplin began in the 1950s when scholars began researching his life. During the 1960 centennial of Sedalia, there was a ragtime concert. Reflecting the times, two concerts were held, one at the Black High School and one at the White High School. America's greatest musical creations, ragtime, jazz, rock and roll, have been a mixture of cultural traditions, usually African and European. And every one of them has had to carry the nation's racial baggage. White audiences loved and feared ragtime. A demeaning genre of music called coon songs was popular at the time. Insulting depictions of African Americans were common on sheet music covers. It was America's first truly original popular music. It was very vital, but it uh, didn't arrive without a fight. One, one trouble with it was that uh, people knew about how a lot of it came from the origins, so the sporting districts and so forth, and that, that worked against the music. A lot of people confused ragtime with these, these terrible coon songs and some of the simple cakewalks of the period, you know, whereas the real ragtime is a piano art. Because it was African American, uh, white Americans kind of had two views of it. One was, wow, this is really neat, and oh my goodness, this is terrible. And they coexisted. So you'll find people being very excited about ragtime and buying it and dancing to it. But on the other hand, you'll find educators writing about the evils of ragtime and how it'll ruin a young pianist's technique to play this music. In 1901, Joplin moved to St. Louis with a new wife and a hit song. Maple Leaf Rag would eventually go on to sell more than a million copies of sheet music, which was particularly impressive for a song that difficult to play. He moved into this house at 2658 A. Morgan, which today we call Del Mar. And over the next three years, he taught music lessons, played in the saloons around Union Station, and composed. In 1902, eight of his compositions, including The Entertainer, were published. He wrote his first opera here, Guest of Honor, a tribute to Theodore Roosevelt's White House dinner with Booker T. Washington. Today, there is no trace of the opera, and it remains one of the great mysteries of American music. He wrote the Cascades to commemorate the St. Louis World's Fair. Then began a string of tragedies that continued throughout the rest of his life. He and his wife lost their infant child. Their marriage fell apart. Joplin left St. Louis, remarried, and lost his bride to pneumonia ten weeks after their wedding. And then there was Tremonitia, his second opera. It was to be the capstone of his career, a story of a young African-American woman leading her people to freedom. But there were no backers, and when he published and staged it with his own money, there was no audience. Joplin died of syphilis in 1917 in a Manhattan mental hospital at the age of 49, impoverished and largely forgotten. Even his music was being forgotten, as audiences turned from ragtime to jazz. But Joplin had always written for a generation beyond his own. Two years before his death, he predicted, maybe 50 years after I'm dead, my music will be appreciated. Joplin made his comeback in the 1970s, by way of Hollywood. For African Americans, the movie The Scott Joplin Story, where Billy Dee Williams portrayed Scott Joplin, that got us uh, familiar with Scott Joplin. But for Caucasians, I think it was the movie The Sting. In 1974, his unmarked pauper's grave received a headstone. The following year, Tremonisha was performed and won the Pulitzer Prize for Music in 1976. Today, his home in St. Louis receives visitors from all over the world. Scott Joplin has received the recognition he sought all his life as a serious American composer, the king of ragtime writers. He left us the music. He left us instructions on how to play the music, in his own words. He left us some insight into the life of an African-American artist and composer at the beginning of the 20th century. So along with Mozart and Beethoven and Debussy, he left us with a repertoire for pianists to play 
and audiences to enjoy.